I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This is a fascinating story. Do you know that every time there's a major crisis, 9-11, the 2008 housing crisis, March 2020 with the pandemic, or even in 1987 when the market fell 20% in a day, every time there's a major fast crisis like that, there's one type of person and basically people who follow this one very, very specific investment strategy that make millions and millions of dollars. And this is the only time they make money. But because no one ever expects a crisis to occur, these people make much more money than they lose during quiet periods. So when nothing's happening, when nothing bad is happening, these people lose a tiny bit of money every month. But when the crisis happens, they make thousands of percent on their money. And Scott Patterson wrote a book called Chaos Kings, How Wall Street Traders Make Billions in the New Age of Crisis. He doesn't talk about all Wall Street traders. There's just a handful of people who do this. You have to be a particular type of person, and it's a very particular type of strategy. But we talk about what type of person that is, what type of strategy this is, who these chaos kings are, and how much money they make. They make billions in some cases, and how you can apply this sort of philosophy to your own life, whether it's investing or just life. So here's Scott and I talking about the chaos kings. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. What do you think, Scott? If the lockdown didn't happen, would 2020 still have been probably the craziest election we've seen in our lifetimes? Yeah, probably. But I certainly think it catalyzed it, gave it a lot of fuel and energy everywhere. It wasn't just a, you know, right wing. I mean, you had the George Floyd protests. I'm right around the corner from the White House where all that happened here at Lafayette Square Park, where they ran down those protesters and tear gassed them. I mean, I think there's no doubt without all of the insanity that came with the pandemic, it caused the conspiracy theories, the following year with the vaccine that really bifurcated people. You know, people I know who I thought were pretty normal went off the deep end about the vaccine. <laughs> and it pushed them into further reaches of uh, conspiracy thinking. I mean, if you remember the Canada truckers, like they, yeah, I, the guy and I was saying the truckers, like what Canada is doing to the truckers is just as bad as what Putin was doing to protesters in Russia protesting the Ukrainian war. And I thought, that, you know, not that the same. doesn't really <laughs> compare. 
remotely. Um, I mean, there was a lot of stuff uh, with the, the pandemic and it was hard not to politicize it because for instance, I was not in favor of for an entire year or however long it was shutting down all businesses in the economy. Cause now we're experiencing what we're experiencing now, which is this weird economy where somehow things are both good and bad at the same time, but we also don't know if they're good and bad. Like it's, it's just a crazy economy right now. Like none, none of the data makes sense. And yeah. It hasn't made sense for a couple of years. And then you have to also ask the question, like, is the government really allowed to shut down every business? Because, you know, we have a right to our property. And, and but that makes me sound all of a sudden like a conspiracy theorist. Just be, just stating an opinion now makes you sound crazy, even if it's completely rational to ask if something is constitutional or not. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's so much has happened, but I, I think that uh, for a while, at least, a lot of businesses shut down voluntarily. Yeah, which which makes um, sense. Like the market should yeah. should decide. Like, and you don't want your customers to get sick. We didn't know how this thing was spreading, as you mentioned in the book Chaos Kings, which we'll talk about in a, in a second. You know, Nasib Taleb was looking at the R naught of the, how fast the virus was spreading, and that was cause for concern. Like, I stopped my kids from going to school before there was a lockdown, but you know, then three four months later, because of the George Floyd and BLM protests, were organizing quite innocently of. 20, 30,000 people, but they were still keeping mm -hmm. furniture stores closed, which typically have no customers in their store. So, right. so there was things happening that were irrational, but if you stated an, an opinion like what I just said, you were considered an outlier of some sort, either to the left or to the right. I don't even know. Yeah, it's hard to keep track of it all. It's, it's just a sort of a blur now. I know it is. Thing. It, but that period is where my the idea for my book was born, actually. It was born out of the chaos of 2020. Essentially, 2020, like 2008, was one of those moments where what happened should never have happened if you use just basic probabilities and statistics. Like the odds mm -hmm. of the market going down 40%, you know, depending on which market you're looking at, in a matter of days, if you use basic statistics, it would be one in a billion. But mm -hmm. as the steam Taleb has shown over and over again, and as you describe in the book Chaos Kings of all the people who benefit from such statistically impossible moves, these so-called black swan events happen more often than statistics predict, suggesting that you can't use the basic, basic, basic mathematical model of statistics to model the markets, and yet everyone does. <laughs> and not just the right. markets, but elections, incidents in your life, wh whatever bad thing could happen, that you think will never happen often happens. Yeah. <laughs> but good things too. There's there's good, there's positive black swans too. So oh, what <clears throat> give me an example of a positive black swan. Maybe the internet, something that we didn't anticipate at all, and then has come around and totally revolutionized our lives. And uh, you know, there's dark sides to the internet, obviously. But this is not something that people predicted would happen. Except, you know, if you were working at Bell Labs in, you know, the 1960s or something. Yeah. But you could say a stock like Amazon has black swan-like characteristics. It's true. How could a company that continually loses money year after year <laughs> become one of the biggest companies in the world? So I think that in the market, the negative black swans are more common because you don't see 40% moves up very often right. because of the deleveraging characteristics of crashes. But in our daily lives and with some stocks, just last week, a solar company went up 25% just on one announcement from the IRS about a tax credit. And this is what, it's the biggest solar company in, in America, actually, for solar. So, and that's a lot. I mean, 25, it was like a $25 billion market cap. It's interesting though, like this is like an evolutionary thing where loss aversion is much more powerful than greed. Fear is more powerful than greed because, yeah. you know, when you're walking in the jungle and you hear a noise in the one in a thousand chance it could be a lion, you don't want to die. So you just immediately run. Whereas if you were more motivated by greed, maybe, oh, this is an animal you could hunt, or maybe there's just a fruit tree rustling in the wind, but you don't, you'd much rather have, you know, take into account the one in a thousand chance and save your life, then the, the more likelihood that is just nothing. Right. So, yeah. And what you do in your book is you document the really fascinating stories of the people who specifically bet on extremely low probability events 
and the killings they made in the pandemic and in 2008 and in 1987, not because they're glorifying like, oh yeah, we got a pandemic, let's make some money, but they mm -hmm. bet long in advance that the world was too complacent and and relying too much on, oh, the market goes up 1% a day or down 1% a day and very rare that it goes up or down more. I mean, they were betting, these people were betting yeah. on huge significant moves that never happened. So those bets are priced very low, meaning they could make an enormous amount of money if they happen. And they always seem to happen more than we expect. Probably initially, they just looked at these instruments and said, man, that's really cheap. You know, I could buy this thing for 10 cents, you know, this derivative contract and no one else wants it. And I just keep buying that. I think that's what Nassim was doing in the 80s. And it kept paying a hover. And so he, it was the market opportunity first. And then he kind of backtracked into the sort of the black swan philosophy of yeah. why it isn't happening and why do I keep making so much money on something that goes from 60 cents to $400. It's not statistically probable. And it's fascinating because people will think you're ridiculous until they don't. <laughs> Meaning like nobody would have predicted 1987 in the stock market crash in October of that year that the market was, that the Dow Jones would fall 22% in a single day. Because that would mean like right now, like let's say the, the Dow's at 33,000 now. So that would mean it would have to go down to around almost 26,000 tomorrow for it to go down over 20%. And Nassim Taleb was the sort of person who was making bets that in a day, that's what's going to happen to the Dow. When that, on an average daily basis, that is just ludicrous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I wouldn't say Nassim was necessarily betting on that kind of move, but he certainly was positioned to benefit from it. I think he was betting on something a little less than that. Universe is a 20% move in a month. But I think their idea is you position yourself for this to happen. It happens more often than you think. And it's actually pretty cheap to do so. And you'll never blow up is the other part of it is, is you're not leveraged at all. Right, because you probably don't even use all your cash. You probably just use a small amount of your cash. So mm -hmm. just, to, like, just to kind of summarize to listeners, you know, I will, I will say what we're about to talk about with these black swan events is the exact opposite of how someone like Warren Buffett invests. Warren Buffett being the greatest investor in history, there's nothing wrong with how he invests. This is just the exact opposite. So Warren Buffett takes big bets on a handful of stocks that he thinks over the long run, over a 20 year period, no matter what happens to the market, these stocks will go up. So Coca-Cola, he's owned for over 40 years. American Express, I don't know if he still owns it, but he owned it forever. And mm -hmm. this is sort of completely the opposite. You make you make the sort these sorts of investments that lose a little bit of money every month while things are normal. And then the one month out of a hundred that things go crazy, these might make you a thousand times your money or whatever, some outsized number that's much greater than the amount that you've steadily been losing while things were normal. Right. And what they discover and what Nassim and his partner, Mark Spixnagels, discovered implementing this strategy was that those events, when you go down 40, 50%, are what really matter and what you really need to protect yourself against. The monthly bobbles up and down at 5%, those kind of take care of themselves. If you just manage your risk, you, you don't lever up too much, you will make money on the market. What you need to do, according to them, at least, is protect that tail risk, that left side tail risk of a crash. And if you do that, you survive that and you get through it and you end up performing very well. Universe's Spitznagel's hedge fund backtesting has showed that that has actually worked really well in the past 15 years or so. And, and this is not how traditional investors think. They want to benefit on the daily grind upwards. Like a Buffett, he's, you know, there's not a lot of Buffets out there in the world. So he, he does very well at it, but they don't think about that tail risk. They sort of just set it aside. Even risk managers on Wall Street, you know, the value at risk metric that many banks use and hedge funds use calculates the 95% probability of a move uh, every day. That 5%, they're just like, nah, you don't have to worry about that. 
that's not including some 15 days out of the year when you could see a move bigger than what's in that calculation. And I think that in 2008, that's what a lot of these banks found out is if you're not thinking a lot about and protecting against that, that 5% risk, then you could blow up and it's the end of and, and the game. <laughs> you're out of the game forever. Yeah. I'm always trying to figure out how to explain this all simply. So imagine when you're a student and you're being graded on the curve. The curve is a basic statistical model where most people sort of aggregate in the middle and a handful of people will get an A plus and, and another small amount of people will get an F, but most people are around a B or a C. Mm. Believe it or not, that's how most hedge funds and investors model the stock market. So what's what you were just referring to, like how Wall Street models their risk, they're trying to figure out, hey, we own enough things that are uncorrelated with the market. And, you know, here's the odds of if such and such events happen, you know, here's what our max loss probably will be and what our minimum gain or maximum gain would probably be. But what Nassim and other really smart investors have shown is that because all of Wall Street believes that basic statistics rule the market, the bets you could make predict a huge move, either up or down, are very underpriced because no one wants those bets. They're like, oh, that's crazy. So Nassim yeah. and, the, and Mark Spitznagel and other people you mentioned, like Bill Ackman and, and others you mentioned in the book, real fascinating stories, they find the most underpriced bets they could make to make them super cheaply. They're probably going to lose on those bets. But again, in the long run, I mean, what's Universe's returns? This is Mark Spitznagel's fund. They've had average annual returns more than 100% since 2007. I mean, those were audited financial results from Ernst & Young. So they've had phenomenal gains. The hard part of the strategy is that you have to go through months, if not years, of losing all the time. <laughs> That's why it's it sort of goes against basic human nature, which you know, you're saying are loss averse. You have to just accept that that's the price. And the way they like to think of it as an insurance policy. So you're paying your policy, you're fine, your house isn't going up in fire, you know, uh, and you just accept that that's a payment. But when the fire comes, you're protected. And not protecting yourself is as if you're, you know, you're living in a flood zone and, you're, and you have no insurance. And you're just acting like everything's fine and you'll, you'll never get flooded out. You know, it is, it's not just human nature. It's, it's Wall Street nature also, because in 2006, I had the opportunity, I, I met with John Paulson's hedge fund, which famously made billions betting against the housing market. They, they were betting mm -hmm. on the black swan happening, which did happen in 2008, as Nassim benefited as well. They laid out the whole thing. And I remember thinking they're, they're right the world is just doomed right now. Like I don't, and their main concern was, will banks survive long enough to pay them the money they right. owe, which is a common theme, but I couldn't invest with them. They told me on average, they're going to lose 1% a month. I couldn't expose my investors to that. I was running a fund of hedge right. funds and that was too big uh, of a loss for me to take every month if I wanted to keep raising money. Yeah. But they were correct. I wish I had invested them. Now, of course, afterwards, everyone tells me they're invested in them. But I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember talking to funded funds back then that were some that were invested in Paulson and were very excited about it. And that, that was a perfect example. Nobody thought that could happen. The U.S. housing market does not decline as a whole. Never happened before, although it did actually in the Great Depression. And that's, you know, that's been universe's experience is that big investors are really reluctant to give them money because... To them, it looks like a line item, like this huge cost every every quarter, every year. Uh, it's a loss of, you know, depending on how big their position is, $10, 20000000 million. And, you know, for a fund manager, that's terrible because it hurts your performance and you're being judged on your annual performance. That's where your bonus comes from. Your investors start losing faith in you. So as, as successful as their strategy has been, they still have had trouble raising money from institutions like, you know, pension funds. Um, as I recount in the book, they did get a major investment from CalPERS starting around 2016, 2017, the big California pension fund, biggest pension fund in America. The CalPERS was very excited about it, but then there was a management change. They 
looked at those line item losses and said, this is terrible. We got to get out of this thing. It's way too expensive. And they cut their position in January, 2020, uh, oh. just completely liquidated it. So, and they, you know, the, I mean, the calculations are they could have saved their pensioners billions of dollars, two, $3 billion. Although on Buffett's side of things, if you're a long-term holder, then you don't really care that much about market movements. You're just going to assume that eventually the markets will go back to all-time highs. Stocks will return to their glory. So you might miss out on some gains that you could have made short-term, but in the long run, you kind of have a faith in, in oh, okay, biotech's going up in the long run. So I'm going to throw it around to a bunch of biotech stocks and eventually some will succeed and some will fail and I'll be good. You know, and, and you do that in every industry. Well, I, I'd say, I mean, Berkshire Hathaway, which I used to cover for the journal, it's a, it's a unique company in many ways. And, and what people forget is he has a gigantic insurance uh, operation that is constantly, no matter what's going on, it's constantly churning out cash. And that gives Buffett this, uh, you know, dry powder that he uses when markets collapse, like he did in 2008 with Goldman Sachs and, and others. Um, yeah. He's and sitting there with this pile of cash that he can deploy and buy stocks when they're at their cheapest. And that's that not, you know, not many companies have that structure. That's really the engine that drives Berkshire Hathaway is that insurance cash. And a couple of points. One is insurance company is almost the opposite of a black swan sort of investing because an insurance company is using basic statistics to model the fact that Scott Patterson is a man in his 40s or 50s, I don't know, who uh, uh, has never had a car accident before and he's married with two and a half kids and mm. lives in such and such place. So they use basic statistics and they determine, oh yeah, we're going to charge Scott 600 a month for his car insurance and we'll pay out 2 million if he gets into an accident. But you could be a black swan. You could go crazy one day and just drive into a mall and kill a bunch of people. And your insurance is <laughs> like, you know, goes through the roof. So insurance companies in general yeah, they, the, large, the law of large numbers is it works for insurance companies yeah. by and large. That's how they make their money. Interestingly, I mean, the thing I, I do get in the book is with this, you know, one of the arguments I'm making in the book is that things are getting a little bit more crazy for a lot of different reasons. You know, technology, global connectivity is rising. That's something that we, you know, saw uh, in the pandemic and climate change. And, and climate change particularly is raising havoc within insurance companies because those models are not effective anymore in predicting things like flooding, storms, fires, all all that stuff is becoming very difficult and systemic. You know, there's they're seeing climate change as becoming a systemic risk. And a systemic risk is almost by definition impossible to price. So the biggest insurance companies in the world are trying to figure out how can we price these things which are not in the in the historical record anymore the hurricanes are worse and there's just no way to predict it the past of the storms change storms are accelerating because of the heating of the oceans they're trying to use ai to model the risk but things are sometimes changing so fast that even that can't keep up with it so that's just an area where insurance is getting hard <laughs> And yeah, they're, they're coming up with innovative models to try to deal with it, but it's very tricky. You you mentioned AI just briefly, but AI is almost all based on statistics. So it's hard to kind of overcome a bias towards statistics when you're using AI because AI itself is based on statistical modeling usually. Yeah, it's backwards looking. Yeah. But they, they're trying to make it so it learns very quickly or can make predictions that are outside of the law of large numbers. But that's hard stuff. I mean, it's very tricky. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. 
So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. In your book, you kind of mentioned, and this is a very important thing. The big question everybody had after Nassim Taleb wrote The Black Swan is that in general, you can't really predict the unexpected. You can't predict Mm -hmm. a one in a billion event. Else, if it was that really that predictable, it wouldn't be a one in a billion event. You couldn't say, well, it's about, now we're due for a volcano. No one's been able to predict that. 
because it's not it doesn't follow you know actually to get into the nitty gritty it follows sort of a power law distribution of statistics rather than a bell curve which is the, the student's grading model but mm-hmm. without getting into the weeds there it's hard to predict but then you mentioned something called the dragon kings which are more like black swans that can be predicted describe those people and what they do and how well they're doing and so on it's a breed of mathematics known as complexity theory but it, it you know brings in economics physics very high order mathematics the lead practitioner of it that i profile in the book is a french he, he calls him an econophysicist didier sornet he set up shop in in zurich in the mid 2000s to create a financial observatory laboratory where he collects data on hundreds and hundreds of financial instruments and attempts to predict these Dragon King-like events. And it, he, he kind of made up Dragon King to compete with the Black Swan, with Taleb's Black Swan. So it's his own sort of crazy animal, exotic and king-like. The King effect is another mathematical sort of Black Swan um, because kings in the countries that they ruled, their wealth far outperforms everybody else in the uh, country. So Didier... He got his start in the 1990s monitoring the physics behind the blowups of these rockets, these French rockets. And he developed a mathematical formula using the power laws that you mentioned to detect the early signs of such a blowup. He eventually, he started dabbling in stocks and detected similar patterns that you could see in in a blowup of a rocket. What sort of patterns? Like, what was he noticing? Very rapid oscillations up and down in the parameters that he's monitoring. Uh, So with stocks, you would start to see big movements within the market. Maybe the market itself isn't moving as rapidly, but within it, these interior signals indicating some extreme event is on the horizon. So like, for instance, when people were first worried about the pandemic, let's say in February, 2020, a lot of people heard about it for the first time. The stock market was still sort of normal. It was going to all time highs then, but then you mm-hmm. started to see weird things like some stocks would have wild oscillations up and down, but the market wasn't affected as a whole, just like oil crashed to zero or even negative. Like, but it was, and it was only after like a bunch of these things were happening that everybody said, uh Oh, and then the bottom fell out. Yeah. Yeah. In March of 2020. And, and that would be the kind of thing that he, you know, he, he would be looking for is the early indications. So, you know, he's been refining this model over the years and he'll make predictions and then he'll come out and, you know, about a commodity or a country's index like China. Uh, he's had some successes where he's made very accurate predictions and there does seem to be some utility in it. The problem is making very specific predictions of these events is so hard uh, getting the timing right that it's still, in my mind, not a proven methodology for risk management. I'd say it's a useful tool for betting on the market. It may be something that you could use to buy, you know, buy some options. You see a signal and you say, okay, something crazy could happen and you buy some options and it could pay off. But the job of risk managers on Wall Street is not gambling. (laughs) It's managing risk and protecting your clients' portfolios. And I think that as of now, these techniques, they're not equipped to do that because it is market timing. It's It's a form of market timing. And if you try to market time protecting portfolios of of billions of dollars, you're going to miss some things. And, and that's Nassim's argument and Mark Snagel's argument is you can't time these things. It's impossible. You will get wiped out. So you need to constantly have that protection on the books. So again, the, the difference between Nassim's approach of a black swan versus the Dragon King approach of DDR Sarnet is that Nassim every month is finding the cheapest ways to bet that an extreme event will happen. So, and then when those expire, when those bets expire, like he might make a bet, oh, in a month, 
the Dow is going to fall, you know, 10%, which is an extreme. And he found some cheap ways to make that, that bet. And so he just keeps doing that regardless of what's in the headlines. Whereas yeah. Garnett is trying to model it so he can more accurately predict when a black swan will occur. And he calls those dragon Kings. So he might see yeah. there's more mentions of a pandemic in the news and stocks are behaving weirdly. So boom, let's do this. Just like Bill Ackman, you mentioned was, um, yeah doing the same thing with in January of 2020, you know, he started to notice, Oh, if this Wuhan thing gets worldwide. We're in, we're in trouble. And so he basically bet on bad things happening. So he was more like a dragon King guy. I'd say, yeah, exactly. And I'd say it's more like speculation, you know, than risk management. You're weighing the odds of something and you're, you're making a bet. Universa, Nassim and Spitznagel are not making bets at least not on any short-term horizon. They're making a long-term bet that these things happen frequently, more frequently than people realize. And to protect against that downside, it's worthwhile constantly maintaining that portfolio. So it's a, it's a day-to-day thing. Like the, these traders are day-to-day buying these far out of the money put options is, is what they're called to protect the portfolio. They expire, they get new ones. And it's just a, it's a routine. I imagine it's got to be pretty boring, <laughs> like, you know, doing that day after day, then the excitement comes, you get a couple of weeks and you pop like a billion dollars. But, you know, I've, I've saw, I've asked them about that. How does, you know, it's got to be tough, you know, because traders are pay bonuses based on the profits they made. These traders could go years without any profit at all. And that's, you know, that's, that's hard. Do you think, do you do. think it affects their personality? because? Like take Nassim Taleb, he, he, and by the way, he's been on this podcast. He's a good guy. You know, his books are great. I actually wrote about his books. I have a chapter just about his books in my latest book, but you see him get into all these like really crazy Twitter arguments, you know, where mm-hmm. he just like, he just like goes crazy on these arguments and, you know, does it make him like overly negative? Cause he's constantly betting on worst case scenarios every month, day after day. Like you say, he's betting that. He's not hoping for the worst case scenarios, but he's betting on them. And he's done this yeah. for like 30 years. Do you think it like changes your personality or do you think you have to have the personality for that to begin with? Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I do get into that a little bit in the book uh, where I, I recount this uh, Twitter feud that he had with uh, Cliff Asmus at AQR. Yeah. Uh, over AQR is, is very skeptical of tail risk strategies. Um, and that played a role in Calpers deciding to get out um, of, of Universa. Um, no, I think it's you know it's it's a character trait of Nassim that his that kind of bothers his friends the most that he's out there publicly attacking people using all sorts of names, calling and you know calling people charlatans and even worse. Um, He's a very and, pleasant, uh, soft-spoken guy in person. Yeah, he's very nice, very much a gentleman in person, fun to have a drink with. Um, but then you'll see him, you know, just completely go after, and he doesn't, he doesn't care who it is. He'll go after Nobel laureates and, with the same viciousness. Um, I, you know, I, it's hard to say where it comes from. It, it's, uh, I think part of his character was, was born on the trading floors you know, of Wall Street in the 80s in 90s when just you know you were expected to be like that and he he respects that kind of you know no bullshit kind of attitude um and i also i think it's probably why he was able to to do what he did which was basically you know call bullshit on a large uh part of wall street and say that you know the none of these people should be making any money and they should go out of business um, because they're, uh, they, they don't know how to manage money. And when they blow up, they, you know, they take their multi-million dollar paydays and, and walk away with it because they didn't have his, you know, he says skin of the game. Um, yeah. so, you know, I, I wouldn't do what he does. I know smart spits Nagel makes, it makes him uncomfortable. He doesn't even go on Twitter. Um, uh, you know, so he, you know, but he also knows that's just Nassim. That's who he is. And, you know, you learn to live with it. You know, it's also a weird thing in that, like take an event like 9-11. So obviously they didn't know they were betting that 9-11 would happen, a terrorist attack on the U.S. But of course, since they were always betting that the market is going to, 
there's a small, tiny, one in a billion chance that the market is going to have this massive crash and they know that it's actually, the odds are wrong. It's it's going to happen more than one in a billion times. They were in the markets for 9-11, so they made a lot of money that day. And I know some hedge funds even, like there was a fund, Viking, I think it was Viking Global, they actually were, gave their profits to charity after 9-11 because they were betting on a market fall, but because it was that event, they gave the profits yeah. back from that day. And yeah, uh, tricky. Well, Empirica, uh, that, that was the original hedge fund that, that Nassim and Mark launched in 99. They did not make money on 9-11. And the reason is their investors didn't want them to monetize their positions. They, I see. they were afraid. If, if you recall, I was in New York at the time. Everybody was afraid, there, you know, there's going to be another attack. And th this was just the beginning that, you know, uh, who, who knew what was, was going to happen. And you have to act quickly with these positions because they expire quickly. So they held on to them thinking that another shoe could fall and they, they'd never made money on it. That I, I, I talk about that in the book. And as Mark told me, yeah, we were learning our lesson that you have to really know how to position yourself around these things. And it, and it is sort of the dark side of the strategy is you're making money when other people are in misery, you know, yeah. and they don't like that side of it. But at the same time, they see it as protecting their clients and these hard times who are pension funds or other investors who have real people relying on that money. And they see it as being a benefit. And they're happy if other firms do the same thing. They don't personally think that most trading firms can't do it very effectively. I, I don't know. It, it is, I, I think that, you know, what I tried to do was just you know, look at this as a trading strategy and also expand it beyond just the market as a lesson that we can learn in these chaotic times about thinking about risks that we find we're, we're facing. Because it is, a, it's, a, it's a common human trait to think that tomorrow is going to be just like yesterday and we really don't have to think about these, uh, these, these negative, extremely negative um, consequences. Right. But, we really should try to do that and prepare. And climate is one of the areas where I'm, you know, I'm most focused on. It's what I, at the Wall Street Journal, I cover climate and technology is being developed for it. So it's, it's sort of top of mind for me. But, you know, when I first started thinking about this book, the pandemic had just broken out. And it was shocking to see how poorly America managed that. And we clearly hadn't prepared for it. What do you think we should have done? I think that we should have been better prepared. We were very low on the ventilators, obviously. We didn't have a lot of the, you know, the masks. That's one of the reasons why the health officials early on cautioned people not to wear masks because they were worried there'd be a shortage and, and the hospitals wouldn't have access to them. I think that uh, if, as Nassim recommended, and as I recount in, in the book, he was cautioning extreme precaution in January of 2020. And if uh, he and there's, and he wasn't alone, you know, and they, they sent their one page uh, note to the White House at the request of the White House. I think if there had been an earlier response in the U.S. and if we had been better prepared, so that's something that needed, the, the groundwork for that needed to be laid years before, we would have done better. Now we wouldn't have stopped it. You know, the, the, it was a it was very contagious disease, but maybe we wouldn't have the most deaths in, in the world. And, and that, was, that was one of the things that I was just astounded by in 2020 was how is it that America, the wealthiest, most technologically advanced country, is also experiencing the, the most deaths? There's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, we got caught up in all sorts of conspiracy theories. People continued as it spread. And we've seen this in areas where these conspiracy theories were most widely uh, believed in. More people died in those areas. They wouldn't wear masks. I know I don't know why, but the mask thing has become political, and you know you, you see various studies. To me, it seems to make perfect sense. Wearing masks not only protects you from airborne particles, but it keeps the particles from going out of your own mouth and nose. I think widespread masking early on probably would have helped. I'm not an expert in epidemiology, so uh, I'm, I'm not the <laughs> right person to ask. But just looking back on it, I. I 
I, I just remember the thing that, you know, I think the, the initial uh, spark for this book was when I saw in March of 2020, when the entire financial world was in complete meltdown, Universa produces a gain of more than 3,000%. At the same time, Nassim Taleb kind of using a similar approach to extreme events in January of 2020, co-authors a paper identifying the extreme nature of coronavirus and warning that we really needed to take precautions against this thing, because if we don't, it's so contagious that it, pre it presents an extreme risk to the human race. So these two completely different areas by these two guys who had looked at the world in a very similar way, they came out looking pretty good. Like, you know, Universa, the world blows up, they make a billion dollars or more. They actually made a couple billion dollars. I mean, there were expert epidemiologists in March of 2020 saying, hold on now, we don't really know. You know, we need to wait and study this thing. And, and that's the problem that he and others identified was when something that dangerous is coming, you can't really wait around to figure out what the minute properties of it are. You need to act very quickly. As, as they say, panic early. You got to, you, you know, if something is posing a systemic risk, you need to react as soon as possible. And the same thing with investing is you need to invest before. Like Bill Ackman, he panicked. He totally panicked. And that allowed him to buy the instruments before anybody else did. The best holiday ever is officially underway at Bloomingdale's, where you'll discover the most exciting and unique gifts around. The kind of presents that you can't wait to give because they're just that good. So no matter whom you're shopping for, even your sister who has practically everything, you'll find hundreds of picks that deliver on the promise of the best holiday ever right now at Bloomingdale's. When you're on the road, you'll be glad you chose T-Mobile, the network that covers more interstate highway miles with 5G than anyone. T-Mobile is so dependable that AAA chose T-Mobile to be their exclusive wireless partner, connecting their AAA-owned fleet of vehicles across the country. That means if your family is ever stuck on the side of the highway, you can rest assured AAA is finding you with the help of T-Mobile's 5G network. Find out more at T-Mobile.com slash network. Coverage not available in some areas. See 5G details at T-Mobile.com. In the case of Nassim, do you think because he's he's built this muscle over the decades to look for things that, you know, he he notices the initial rumblings of something that could be exponentially grow exponentially more devastating? Yeah, like a volcano, there might be pressure built up inside of a volcano. There's no way to predict if it, if it'll erupt, but you know the pressure's there. But you're relaxed because it might not. You know, it's, it, it, the odds are against it blowing up today, and yet. Nassim would probably stay away from the, the volcano uh, yeah. just in case. But could you get too risk averse? Uh, I, yeah, there's, that's uh, always a risk. I mean, I think that's why experts are always worth consulting. And, and, and Nassim didn't write this paper alone. He, a co-author on the book was Junir Baryam, um, who's the founder of the New England Complexity Institute. He had been an expert in studying uh, the properties of pandemics for decades he worked with the WHO in Africa uh, during the Ebola crisis. He was somebody who had real, you know, world experience managing and examining pandemics. And Nassim had been studying his writings over the years. They they uh, were partners on other papers. Um, but it is, I think, Nassim's uh, an understanding of, of exponential risk that really allowed him to see how quickly it could spread. And he, he's written about this before saying that, you know, we live in an age of connectivity. We have more connectivity out than ever with airplanes flying all, all over the world. Baryam had written a paper about this in the late 2000s, I think, and then another one in the mid 2000s called The Transition to Extinction, uh, which is a scary title, <laughs> um, where he, he uh, is arguing that uh, previous pathogens 
were so deadly that they, you know, they could break out in a village, but it wouldn't really spread that much because it kills everybody so quickly. But with this age of connectivity where people travel to cities, they ride in buses and cars together, they get on planes, we're hitting this point where those deadly pathogens are no longer contained like they used to be. They can spread. And we're reaching a point where if we don't manage a risk of this, we're facing something pretty dire. And, you know, COVID-19 was a, a test of the world's ability to manage something like that. It proved to be not as deadly, but millions of people died. And, and that's, you know, it, it's horrific what happened. And, and I think that, it, I don't know, it feels sort of like we've forgotten about it. Like, I don't, it doesn't, I don't get the sense that it really was, it, it should have been a wake up call. It feels like it wasn't um, for many people. We just kind of want to move on. Yeah, I, I agree. It feels like, like you said in the beginning of the podcast, it's almost like a big blur. Like, when I think of events that happened in 2019, it feels like they happened last year, almost as if I completely like yeah. whacked out the three years in between. But, you know, it, it seems like if you're thinking in that manner, there's lots of potential. I think this is why people are always predicting in the news, this is a black swan event, even though you can't have that many black swan events just by definition. But, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's all sorts of existential risk to humanity. Like there's, there's biotech which if you could clone some virus and spread it around, you know, potentially, you know, and these are theories about coronavirus, like conspiracy theories about coronavirus, potentially you could wipe out the world in a lab. There's, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's talking about AI now in this very conspiratorial way. That's just ridiculous to me, but, but who knows? Uh, there's for, for decades, there's always been the threat of nuclear war. Oh, now, but now if a terrorist group gets nuclear materials, that's, a black swan thing that could happen. So it's almost like there's too many black swan possibilities now. How do you invest it all for, for a positive world? Yeah, well, that's, uh, I mean, that that's what, you know, one of the things I'm trying to argue. And, you know, people will debate that and say things have always been crazy, but there just seems to be some measurable technical developments in the world that are magnifying risks and they interact. Some people call that the poly crisis. Um, some economists and, and others say that this is a new crisis are getting bigger in all these different regimes and arenas and they're interacting and uh, causing something even bigger than some of the parts in terms of risk. It's one of the things that I agree that you could just become completely paranoid and become a prepper and, you know, go out to Idaho and, and, set up shop in a bunker and people do that, yeah. you know, uh, people are, are doing that, but I think that that's not very helpful. And I think that it's better to try to think about the risks ahead of time, not get over paranoid. And that's one of the things that Nassim talks about with this paper that he wrote with Bar Yam and, and a few others, uh, Rupert Reed is, is another person he wrote this paper with called the precautionary principle. That is an attempt to, in a way, uh, quantify systemic risk and characterize it in a way that, you know, he'd say, here are the things that we really need to worry about and be very precautious about. And the other stuff is out there, but it's not systemic. It doesn't have these various characteristics that uh, you need to look for for something to, so that you ap apply the precautionary principle. That this precautionary principle has been around for decades. It's very, it's it's fairly well known in Europe, um, where it's encoded in in law in some of the countries and in international law. And what it prescribes that when a risk is so extreme that it presents a threat to humanity, the people engaging in that activity need to prove mathematically or through other means that that risk actually doesn't exist. With COVID, it's an interesting example because there's a there's a very big mm -hmm. danger to this, which is which is like what happened in, in COVID, either correctly or incorrectly. Which is everybody was told you have to stay in your house and shut down your business. So normally, if that happened in a normal year, people would say, "Are you crazy? I got to make a living," and you can't tell me to just. It's not like every home is a jail. This country is America. It's or or Europe or wherever. It's a free free world, but. At the same time, the math was there too that, I mean, the New York Times was predicting over a hundred million deaths would happen worldwide, which was, you know, the other extreme. So, 
you could go either way in terms of the math. Yeah, I think that, you know, with COVID in the beginning, because of the, the are nots that were, people were saying that, you know, how many people a single person could infect, it was in three to four range. That was, you know, putting it in the highest level of contagious disease ever seen. And that's one of the things that shrieked out and seem and others is if it's so contagious, you really, it, it's going to spread exponentially. It, I think, that, I'm not sure what it settled on in the r I mean, it was two. Yeah, two, two or two and a half. So it, it wasn't quite as contagious. And that might have been because of the precautions. You know, I think that if people did just continue to, to go on as life as usual, it would have been a lot worse. I think what people were hoping was that this, you know, it just kept on going. I think that the hope was a lockdown of, you know, and it wasn't like, I don't, I don't recall it's being, except for in some states, a government mandated lockdown. It was people doing it on their own. They, they, you know, I know that's what I did. I saw this thing spreading and just stopped coming into the office. So a lot of people just started doing that and some people couldn't. And, you know, like the meatpacking uh, companies and those people got really sick. So in places that didn't, impose these restrictions. You saw a lot of spread. A lot of people died in, you know, very low income uh, companies and industries. You know, I mean, it's obviously hard, but the problem, I think the problem was it was very haphazardly applied and a lot of people didn't take those precautions. I think the idea was you just, you kind of, you break the chains and it stops spreading and it proved, it proved, it proved to be very hard to contain. I mean, you know, China, Case in point, they tried to do that, impose these, and this was two years into the pandemic, forcing people to stay locked up in their houses, which is not something I, you know, or I don't, you know, Nassim would advocate. And it it didn't work because it's, you know, there's too many people moving around and it continues to spread and you also crash your economy. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard stuff. It's hard stuff, you know. But I, from what I remember back then, and the idea was a very short lockdown period that keeps it from spreading. But that just that didn't work, and a lot of people didn't didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea would be since the virus lives for two weeks after it gets to someone, you know, two weeks give or take. The idea would be, hey, if we all just stay inside for two weeks, the whole virus is gone around the world. And yeah. But that never really happened. I mean, it was just a few weeks ago they declared the virus emergency over. It's like three years later. So I know, I know. And, and you know, and again, I'm not being critical of any. It was like you said, some epidemiologists said, "Oh no, don't worry." I mean, and they're smart people. Just just like in the housing crisis in 2008, there were very smart people saying, "This is going to be fine. This is all going to work out fine." Like. There are hedge funds and who study these things all day long because they don't want to lose people's money and they want to make money. And they were investing in housing stocks and bonds and insurance companies and so on. While while other people were saying, no, 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 it's everything's going to crash and burn. So it's like equally intelligent people on opposite sides of the coin. I'm just wondering what what makes the difference between these these people? Because they're they're like equal in every other respect on paper, and yet one sees the catastrophe and the other doesn't maybe the ones who see the catastrophe the reason they're still around is because they see catastrophes everywhere but they've learned how to manage the risk of seeing those catastrophes as opposed to just flaming out on the first bad prediction yeah i mean i i think that uh you know the way that nasim and march the snake would look at it is if you're relying on predicting the catastrophe you're going to blow up <laughs> You, just, you can't you can't do it consistently. And you had to look at John Paulson. I mean, he made a great bet, but then he he made terrible investments in the years following that, yeah. uh, in gold and, and some other things. I mean, as you as you know, managing risk on Wall Street is is very difficult. And uh, I think that they have developed a pretty effective model for getting through these things. And one of the key parts of the universe of strategy is that. No one would give all their money to Universal. You know, that would be a crazy thing to do. What they recommend is you put in a tiny percent of your portfolio, say 3%, and the rest you put in stocks and, you know, the S&P 500. And so you get to benefit from the upside in the many years that the market goes up. And then when you get a crash, you've got that tail risk protected. 
and you get a, a nice you know, infusion of cash when everybody else is cash poor. But this is not a speculative strategy. It's a formula for investing and getting through these uh, extreme periods. Right. And I think that that insurance is really what's the important part of it. It's a good way to think about it, insurance. And just to get a little bit more into the weeds, they're buying a kind of option most people aren't even aware of. People know about, and, and this is too mm -hmm. much into the weeds, but people know about calls. They're not really as aware of puts, which is uh, sort of the option equivalent of short selling. And because of that, puts tend to be not priced accurately because they're not as liquid a market. And particularly like, again, because people have model things using basic statistics, the one in a billion type of puts are priced very cheap. So it's a form of arbitrage. Yeah. So, so in Nassim's model, the prices of these things are too cheap compared to what his model shows they should be because the risks are actually higher than people think. And so if they were, if they were priced accurately, he wouldn't make any money on them, but they're priced right. inaccurately. And he's discovered that. So he's, he's able to make this bet every month. And then in the long run, sooner or later, he's going to make way more money than he's lost because of the inaccurate pricing. It's a form of arbitrage and he's done very well with it. Now, Didier Sinet, what are the dragon Kings that are on the horizon that he's watching out for right now? He is, he's sort of got this long-term prediction that society is heading towards collapse. <laughs> so, uh, he would recommend buying a lot of puts. Uh, he, he's dating that in the next coming decades, but it's, it's something that's been born out of some complexity theory. Uh, Joseph Tainter is one of the original thinkers that, that, uh, have made similar predictions and Didier has built his predictions on that. And which is the fundamental idea of it is that we're getting too complicated. Society is getting too complicated for a variety of reasons. And we can't manage that complexity anymore. Things are running out of control and AI would be one of them, uh, the, you know, energy crisis, climate crisis. And because of that, we're going to run into, um, systemic issues like food insecurity water crises, war, things that combine to create a, a collapse. I mean, I, I feel though like, like stuff like food insecurity or food shortages, that's been predicted ever since 1830, you know. With, Malthusian. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard to, to not, there's a fine line between being a crackpot and taking something seriously. On the flip side though, I mean, if you go back, let's say 60 years to the 60s, you know, Gordon Moore, the, or at the time he was the CEO of Intel, he was, he said famously Moore's law that computers were going to double in power every 18 months, roughly what he said. It's an ex exponentially growing industry. And there weren't really other exponentially growing industries, but now because computers have grown exponentially, he was, he was correct. That's created the exponential growth of many other industries that use computers to model themselves. So like biotech yeah, that's or a good point. AI or robotics or automated driving or whatever. So it could be the same thing, maybe on the risk side that maybe the, as Nassim says, with the connectivity of everything, plus again, computer power, you know, growing exponentially, maybe that exponentially increases the number of black swan events that will occur. Like between 1987 and 2008, it was like 20 years, but now we're starting to have more craziness all the time, it seems. Yeah, I think it seems like things are getting a little wobbly, <laughs> but I, I don't want to be pessimistic about it. I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of potential positive. We talked about positive black swans. I'm, as I said, in, the, in this climate space and looking very closely at the technologies that are being developed by all sorts of brilliant people. And it's, ex it's exploding. I mean, it's literally exploding in terms of the money coming into it. You know, the sharpest minds of the universities are going into these technologies now. And the potential for, you know, very cheap energy that's going to be available around the world in the coming decades is, is you know, very hard to get your mind around what that could do. Because, you know, if, if we get off of the volatility of, of fossil fuels, which will devastate some countries that are, you know, petrostates, the benefits that we could get from widespread, very cheap energy that can be put anywhere, you know, on a Pacific Island or in sub-Saharan Africa is, is really remarkable. And I think it has potential for transforming society, but there's a lot of things in, in the way, of, you know, standing in the way of that happening, political, mostly entrenched interests, very rich uh, industries 
that uh, are benefiting from the status quo. But that's one thing that I, you know, the, the climate debate can be extremely depressing depending on who you listen to. But there's a lot of really fascinating things going on to it, and, and society is mobilizing in all sorts of ways to, to try to make this happen. Uh, finances, you know, that's, I come in edge from the financial perspective, talk to people in charge of billions of dollars that think this is the, this is the big thing for them. You know, even big oil companies are getting into it. Oh yeah. They see the, the money in it. And they want to protect their downside, you know, so like Exxon works on yeah. getting energy out of, you know, seaweed and algae. Like they're doing all sorts of, you know, things that normally they wouldn't care about. So, they're getting into cli- uh, uh, carbon capture. Yeah. In a big way. I mean, that's a, it's not car- really very well known, but it's, it's happening. Carbon capture, by the way, is a huge, huge business opportunity for the simple reason that everyone's going to be required to be involved in it at some point without really fully explaining what it is right now. But, but the other thing is too, you always make money when something's mispriced and because the government mm-hmm. basically sets the prices on these carbon credits, it's permanently mispriced because it's the government. It's not letting the market <laughs> do it. It's just the government doesn't really know. It's like, that's, that's like the old Soviet union putting the, making the price of eggs, you know, a ruble. They don't really know what the market says the price is. They're just setting a price. And so it's always wrong. Yeah. And and so it's in a very interesting industry right now for that, sure. for that reason. But mm-hmm. um, I, I have to say your book was very I- inspirational to me. Chaos Kings just because, you know, you, you, you don't just explain like what this is. You, you really describe the backgrounds and personalities and stories of the people making major amounts of money in this area. And, and you really go into detail in their trading philosophies. One could read this book and, and potentially emulate these trading philosophies. It reminded me in a weird way, it's a completely different style of book, but it reminded me of the book written, I think it was around 1999, Market Wizards by Jack oh, Schrager. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the, yeah, I've, I've talked to Jack before. Yeah, because and and the reason I say that is after I read that book, I wanted to be a day trader, and <laughs> after reading your book, I want to invest in like black swan strategies and come up with my own you know formulas and so on. So it like got me thinking, and and it was inspirational that way. But it's useful to know uh, for any investor out there or anybody just interested in in risk in your own life. Uh, it, it's just an invaluable book to see what the theories are, how it's related to chaos theory. You know, it's really benefited the people who subscribe to these types of philosophies. And I just highly encourage people to read it. Uh, Chaos Kings, How Wall Street Traders Make Billions in the New Age of Crisis. Good subtitle. Usually I hate subtitles. And it's by, <laughs> by Scott Patterson. I've had so many subtitles, I forgot which one we landed on. But yeah, it's... Yeah, and and Scott Patterson, you also wrote uh, about high-speed traders. Well, you, you wrote the book Dark Pools, which got everybody terrified of all this like secret high high frequency trading that's happening that's going to bring down the markets i remember having those discussions when your first <laughs> book came out and for or that book i don't know if that was your first but uh no yeah yeah the it, quants was my first one. Oh um, yeah i remember yeah. that one too you talked uh, this guy i played used to play poker with uh, from and he was yeah, a, a lot Stanley, of poker peter, guys. peter Muller. yeah peter Muller. yeah yeah he, very good scrabble player also and he was he, he was yeah, all that sure. And does the high speed trading still happen? Like, is that still an issue? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's um, it, it's I, I haven't really delved into it in detail recently, but it's it's bigger than ever. It dominates. Uh, it's going to continue to dominate. It's spread around the world at this point. I, when I wrote that book, it was really the U.S. and uh, some in Europe, but it's now it's just this global connected grid of traders using lasers and. <laughs> Yeah, the fastest computers you can imagine. I would think it's like a race to the bottom. Like ultimately, you can't go fast enough. Like, like these people were jacking right into the exchange, and like you say, using yeah. very sophisticated technology. There's only so close you can get to the exchange before you're all jamming into each other. Maybe it's yeah. spread around because you have to find new markets that aren't sophisticated to do this. You know, I knew PhDs whose sole job was to shave off like two microseconds from a latency in a trading machine. Wow. <laughs> so. Yeah, it was crazy stuff. Scott Patterson, thank you so much. It's such interesting stuff. I really am a, a fan and I, I, I've i read your books. This book is great. And I'm always interested in the work of Nassim Taleb. Uh, and finally, I got a chance in through your book. to I didn't really know his biography, his, his story all the way back. And, you know, how he initially made his first money 
and and so on, like in in the crash in 1987. He was basically his father was basically born out of crisis in some way, and <laughs> right. it's so so interesting. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you, James. This is great. The best holiday ever is officially underway at Bloomingdale's, where you'll discover the most exciting and unique gifts around. The kind of presents that you can't wait to give because they're just that good. So no matter whom you're shopping for, even your sister who has practically everything, you'll find hundreds of picks that deliver on the promise of the best holiday ever right now at Bloomingdale's. When you're on the road, you'll be glad you chose T-Mobile, the network that covers more interstate highway miles with 5G than anyone. T-Mobile is so dependable that AAA chose T-Mobile to be their exclusive wireless partner, connecting their AAA-owned fleet of vehicles across the country. That means if your family is ever stuck on the side of the highway, you can rest assured AAA is finding you with the help of T-Mobile's 5G network. Find out more at T-Mobile.com network. Coverage not available in some areas. See 5G details at T-Mobile.com.